You're listening to another episode of the Young Investors Podcast, so sit back and relax as myself, Brandon, and my buddy Hamish discuss the latest in the world of finance and stock market investing. Now, a quick reminder before we get into the podcast is that nothing in this podcast should be taken on as personal financial advice. If you're ever unsure about your finances or investing and you need some help, make sure you reach out to a qualified financial advisor. But with all that said, let's get into another episode of the Young Investors Podcast. Welcome back, everybody. Hello, Hamish. Hello. What's going on over in Melbourne? How you doing? Oh, not too much. Not not too much going on. I'm a little bit tired today, actually. I couldn't had one of those nights where you just can't get to sleep, so that's uh, kind of Damn. unfortunate. So I'll try and uh, I had a big coffee this morning, so I'll try and get my brain kind of <laughs> kind of working this morning. But turn your brain on. Uh, it's, it's actually, <laughs> I can't remember where that's from. I don't know what that's from either, but it's actually one of those mornings. I I kind of feel a little bit slow, so I'm. <laughs> I'll, uh, I feel like that's the story of the podcast most weeks. It's like a lot of the time we get started and you're like, oh, I'm just a bit tired. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, that's a good point. Um, maybe, I, maybe I should go see someone about my sleep. <laughs> maybe. Maybe you've got like sleep apnea or something. You just don't I, know it. I actually did a sleep study once because uh, in, oh, really? in high school because I, I had a really bad sleep problems and they couldn't find anything. Right. So they just sent me home. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I did the whole thing where they put all the things on you and you sleep in the hospital and- yeah, yeah they, didn't, um, they didn't find anything. They said, yeah, you're fine. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you're all good, man. <laughs> yeah. And, cle- and clearly I'm fine. It's, it's yeah, clearly, clearly no longer fine. a problem. So I still can't sleep, but yeah. at least I'm fine. I haven't slept in years, but you know, it's fine. <laughs> <Yeah>. It's fine. <laughs> it's what the doctor said. Nothing to worry about. <laughs> I'm going crazy. Uh, anyway. Oh, boy. Jeez, we got a lot to talk about today. We do. I don't know what we'll get through. I guess uh, I don't want to mention too many stories if we don't kind of get to them because there is a lot going on at the moment. One thing we will talk about, though, is the World Economic Forum, which started just a couple of days ago. Uh, And uh, we've got some Fed updates. And uh, I don't know. What else do you think we'll get to? Some interesting Uh, stuff out of- Talk about Terra Luna. Yeah. Which is uh, this cryptocurrency thing. And I'm not huge on crypto, but I did try and kind of understand it to a basic extent because what's going on there is just ridiculous. Mm. Some of like the biggest losses I've ever seen, biggest percentage (laughs) losses I've ever seen. So, yeah. um, Talk about that. Um, Talk about uh, maybe what's going on in Ukraine as well. There have been some estimates on what the cost of reconstruction in Ukraine is going to be. Oh, boy. It's a big number, but we'll get to that. Um, Mm. All right. Should we get started? Yeah. Today's episode is sponsored by ShareSite, which is an application you can use to track the performance of your stock portfolio. So you can bring in all of your trades either automatically by connecting your broker or by adding them one by one or using Excel. And once you do so, it will track all of the gains and losses in your portfolio. So capital gains, dividends. If you have dividend reinvestment plans, it will do all of those calculations for you. Currency gains, if you're buying shares internationally or you hold foreign currencies. Uh, And then you can also use it for when it comes to tax time. So ShareSite generates up to 12 different reports that can be used to track the performance of your portfolio and used at tax time to work out things such as capital gains, dividend income, and more. At the moment, you can try ShareSite for free by heading over to sharesite.com forward slash young investors. That's site spot S-I-G-H-T, sharesite.com forward slash young investors. So use that link, sign up to a free plan and track up to 10 holdings for as long as you want. Uh, or you can also sign up to a paid plan. And if you use our link, you'll get four months off a yearly subscription. And it's uh, kind of not quite, but coming up to tax time in it'll, Australia, it'll New be Zealand. Here so before you know it. Yeah. So uh, if you uh, want to get on top of your stock portfolio and make it, click of a button to do your capital gains and dividend income and that sort of thing. Uh, check out share site. It's really good. Yes, indeed. Um, do you want me to start with this? This is a quick story just about yeah. Ukraine. Um, so I alluded to it before. Some people have been talking about the cost of reconstruction in Ukraine. Hmm. Um, this is a CNBC article, I think. Uh, it says the cost of Ukraine's reconstruction after the country's devastation by Russian forces will be colossal. Yeah, well, no, no shit, Sherlock. <laughs> um, Ukrainian officials have estimated it at a potential six hundred billion dollars. Wow, six hundred billion. With some saying that figure is modest and set to increase as the invasion drags on. Wow, six hundred billion dollars. That is a sh- a lot of construction, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of destruction, set to be a lot of construction. But man, how sad is that? Yeah, that's um, that's tragic. That yeah, Stop. it's going to cost that much. Yeah, yeah. especially for um, smaller countries as well with smaller economies. That's a 
that's an enormous number. Even yeah. if you put that in like, I don't know, the US or something, for example, that's an astounding amount of money. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's so insane. 2020 Ukraine's GDP was 155 billion US dollars. So that's many, many, many years worth of GDP. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, so that it's kind of prompting this question. Well, what, like obviously things do need to be rebuilt. So what, what are we going to do about it? Like mm. how are we going to, you know, hopefully this invasion kind of stops hopefully soon. I, I'm no expert. I don't know, you know, I don't know what's likely or what's not likely, but I certainly hope it stops as soon as possible. Um, but now they're thinking like, what, what are they going to do about it? So it says here, um, international financial institutions have stressed the need for something uh, like a Marshall Plan for Ukraine involving billions in grant money from allied countries, but faced with the prospect of years of debt put on their own, uh, their own citizens to rebuild a country that isn't theirs, some governments are reluctant to sign on. Mm. I guess that makes sense because it's kind of like, uh, I guess it's kind of like foreign aid, but of course, even with foreign aid, a lot of citizens get really pissed off with that because it's like, hey, why don't you spend the money within our borders to fix our problems before you go help? So, it's always yeah. a kind of controversial issue. Oh, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm usually all for kind of foreign aid, like helping those that are less, you know, in a less fortunate position, but it does tick off a lot of people, that's for sure. Yeah. And especially given the inflation kind of problem that's going on in a lot of places i think governments are kind of or at least the the pe people are, he are wanting governments to be kind of hesitant on on spending on things um yeah regardless of whatever it is uh so that kind of adds an element to this as well i guess yeah so they're saying the solution what is the solution uh it's apparently russian money says ukrainian foreign oh. minister <laughs> uh, dimitrio kuleba sorry if i butchered that pronunciation uh, quote, I don't think that American, German or any other taxpayers in the world should have to pay what Russia did. There is an alternative way to recover Ukraine, and that is to make Russia pay for it. Um, yeah, K Kuleba told CNBC's Hadley Gamble during a blah, in panel session at the World Economic Forum, which we'll talk about later. Yes. Quote, seizure and transfer. Kuleba said on Wednesday, "This is why European. This is why European Commission has recently come up uh, with certain initiatives on how to create a legal framework for that. Canada passed a piece of law that allows not only the seizure of assets, but also the transfer of those assets to projects associated with the recovery of Ukraine. Um, make Russia pay for it." He wow. emphasised. There you go. Yeah, they can sell all of those yachts that they seized from. Um exactly. <laughs> Don't know if there's. $600 billion worth of yachts floating around, but you never know. <laughs> Might be able to scrounge around a little couple billion there. So, uh, no, yeah. that's really interesting. So, I guess these are assets that are offshore that are yeah. available to be seized. Um, yeah. Because, yeah, because I, I was wondering how that would kind of work. But that's, that's an interesting kind of approach, I guess. Yeah. It would be kind I, I I mean, I would find it just a, a tad bit funny if Russia caused this whole mess they caused all this devastation, destruction, and I shouldn't say Russia. I should say the Russian Government, leaders. Yeah, leaders, yeah. yeah. So, like the Russian people are great, um, but it's just the select few leaders that are causing all this. Yeah. Um, but it would be kind of funny if they caused all this destruction and then somehow the rest of the world bands together and the, the Russia has to pay for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess it's just a lose lose all round. I mean, Ukraine not a good situation. has gone through so much damage. Even the Russian people have to deal with all of this and the cost of it potentially. So it's just true. That's one yeah. thing I would hate to see. I'd hate to see the Russian people have to pay for the, like, it's, yeah, you're right. It's just a lose lose because you just, don't want yeah, the Ukrainian people to have to pay for it. You don't want. Uh, you know, allies yeah. to pay for it. You don't want the Russian people to suffer. No. But, I mean, really what you want is it to come out of Vlad's back pocket. That's really <laughs> what you want, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we could dream. <laughs> um, anyway, the World Bank estimates that Ukraine's economy will be cut in half by the end of 2022. That's wow. so sad. That's crazy. Crucial ports and export lanes are being blocked by Russia, which risks sparking a global food crisis as Ukraine is a major source of agricultural produce for much of the developing world. Mm. So there you go. Wow. $600 billion of damage. It's You're right. There's nothing. There's just nothing nice about a war. No. Nothing. 
It's just grim. Yeah. Very sad. And I hope it doesn't happen. Yeah. Hope we don't continue to see kind of, well, I mean, it's kind of inevitable, I think, but it's always sad when there's a large scale, particularly a yeah. large scale conflict that's going on. And yeah, hopefully it ends soon. Uh, when, when did the conflict start? At the start of this year, right? In January or something I like think that? So. Like the actual military conflict. So um, yeah, it's been, it's been kind of You know what they should do hmm. is they should- if they want, if 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 a country wants to invade another country, or two countries want to go to war, they should get independent estimates of what their military power is worth, and then they replicate that military power in a giant game of army men. So they just play play like Age of Empires. They, they just play, play like Age a, of, a really yeah. important Age of Empires. I'm thinking like game. tabletop army men. You get the oh, top okay. graphical map out. Yeah, you yeah. place your little army men and your cannons, and you throw your marbles across, try and knock them down. And whoever wins that wins the war. No, li- no, no <laughs> lives lost. You just knock them over. It's, plastic it's just dog. a simulated, a simulated it's just war. Simulated yeah. war. Yeah. That'd be weird. That that would be strange. Anyway, yeah. I don't think that's one of my brightest ideas, but then again, <laughs> war's, war's not a particularly bright idea either. So anyway, geez. Oh, dear. To, it's not a good situation, but no. anyway. Anyway. What should um, we talk about next? We need, yeah. something to, need something to pick us up. Well, well, you mentioned the World Economic Forum, and that's kind All of right, kicked off there. in Davos over the last couple of days. This is an annual meeting where essentially a bunch of rich and powerful people kind of come together and, and discuss, discuss discuss global issues. So you have kind of CEOs of big companies and and politicians all kind of talking about different things. And there's probably a lot, I think, over the... It's a three-day event and there's been two days so far as of this recording. So um, the full three days will be out um, by the time you're seeing this. But uh, there's usually a lot that I don't find particularly interesting. It's kind of normal kind of political topics that are being discussed. Um, but you kind of have within that sprinkled in some investors that are, uh, I find interesting and I'm sure other people will too. Um, Dalio had a kind of an interview with CNBC um, as he always does. Uh, and Dalio has been kind of saying the same thing for quite a while now. So it's not like he has anything particularly fresh, I think, to to say. Um, he reiterated the three kind of economic themes that he sees going on at the moment. The first being uh, the easy monetary policy, which is driving inflation or has driven inflation. Uh, the internal conflict between the haves and have nots, you know, particularly in the US, um, and kind of the widening of the the two political parties, and then the external conflict between the US and China, which is the kind of the rising world power challenging the US. So he kind of reiterated those uh, those kind of three uh, topics. He was asked about whether the Fed can reduce demand to slow inflation without breaking the the back of the economy, which is kind of the big question we're seeing at the moment as interest rates kind of tick up, is inflation going to come down? And can they do that without causing a recession? Um, and uh, Dalio's kind of blunt answer was was no. Um, so he gave a blunt answer and then he kind of explained himself a little bit. He believes that with interest rates at 2 to 3%, um, which is kind of where they're heading. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, that's kind of where they're heading towards the end of this year. Uh, investors still won't be getting a return above inflation. And as a result, bonds will continue to be sold more than they're being bought, which will just continue to weaken the currency. So that's kind of his theory behind why 2 to 3% rate interest rate increases isn't going to be enough. Um, and that right. with okay. much yep. more significant increases... Uh, it's it's very unlikely they're going to get this you know soft landing that Dalio talks about sometimes where they can or what does he call it like a perfect deleveraging or, or yeah, something, something along like those that. lines. Um, that's what everyone's hoping for at the moment. Where we've seen uh, the US has seen one negative GDP quarter, just hoping that that is an anomaly and that inflation kind of comes down. But it's it's yet to be seen um, mm. so far. So. Yeah, I don't know, like yeah. kind of similar to what he's he's been talking about for, I want to say like a, a year and a half, two years now. So, um, mm. you know, there wasn't anything particularly new there, I think. Um, yeah, did you have any thoughts on that or? Uh, not not really. Um, <laughs> nothing really to add. It, it's Yeah, it's kind of all, all the same. I mean, he- I just, Yeah, yeah I, I, I tend to agree. It's just like if you- if you only raise rates by like a couple percentage points, then it's like, is that going? I've said this before. Is that actually going to do anything? Inflation's at what is it? Eight and a half. Yeah, it's 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 it's. I think it's going to be difficult to to curb inflation without 
people actually feeling the pinch, which will ultimately be a kind of a, re- a recession. Mm. Like there, there has to be kind of that. There's just so much demand. I think there's so much push on the demand side that mm. it, they, I think they're just going to have to raise interest rates to a yeah. point where people are like, I need to save and stop spending. And that will ultimately drive a recession, I think. Um, and that's what Jerome Powell was talking about when he did that uh, interview with the Wall Street Journal. I don't know if you saw that one. I think we spoke yeah. about it a bit last week where he was like, no, we, we have to stop the growth. Like yeah. that's the sad reality of it is yeah. that if we want to get, you know, that's that's the whole point of raising interest rates to curb inflation. We have to stop this yeah. demand. We have to stop the growth of these. Like that's the whole point of it. So, yeah. yeah. So there's that. That's I mean, you asked me to bring us into some something cheery, but it's not um exactly cheery. Well, honestly, like macroeconomic environment, there's not much to cheer about at the moment. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a it's just a tough spot yeah. to be in. Um, but yeah, yeah, pretty much. Oh, uh, it's he, just the reality. We're not trying to be down. We're no. not trying to be sad, but we're trying to just be realistic. I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Um, he was asked again whether he believes cash is trash. Of course, th- that was a famous quote from last year at Davos. Um, he was saying that cash uh, was trash. Um, he was asked again, is it trash, especially considering how poorly equities have performed recently, right? So relatively cash is out, even though cash is continuing True. to lose to inflation, yeah, relatively it's, it's yeah. cash has done better than equities in the last, I don't know how long now, the last couple of months, right? So, um, interesting question. He said, cash is still trash, but equities are trashier. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> That's basically okay. what he said. Um, <laughs> and, and this was kind of him just reiterating his stance that, um, you should be diversified into a lot of different assets, including gold and commodities, which are providing real asset returns at the moment. So right. it's just, it's not that he thinks you should be selling equities or that you should have no cat. It's the, it's his opinion that you should have a wide diversification because I think he said this recently, you don't know, nobody knows where the money is going to flow, right? It's going to flip it, it, at the moment. It's flowing out of equities um, mm. and it's flowing out of the bond market and it's flowing into commodities, uh, at least to some extent. Um, mm. But you don't know where money is going to flow or how the chips are going to going to la- uh, fall. Um, so his kind of view is to just be widely diversified. So again, all of the same stuff he's kind of spoken about for, for a really long time, nothing particularly groundbreaking there, except that he was kind of talking about it in the context of what's actually going on at the moment. Um, then there was one other thing that I thought was interesting, a lot of discussion around the future of globalization. Um, so globalization, of course, has been this effect that's been going on for decades now where businesses have expanded their supply chains across the globe um, in, well, significantly in part to reduce costs. Um, and that's been an extreme uh, deflationary kind of factor on the economy as businesses have been able to reduce their costs by offshoring a lot of jobs and getting inventory from overseas and that sort of thing. Uh, and the other thing is, of course, globalization has driven significant economic growth in developing countries. So allowing developing countries to, well, if developing countries are manufacturing a lot of things for the US, for example, um, it drives a lot of dro- jobs and, and economic growth. Um, but with the recent pandemic and the war in Ukraine, and we've seen so many other supply chain issues with oil and the shipping crisis, there's just been all of these issues of, of globalization. So they had a bit of a discussion around uh, the viability of, of being exposed significantly to other countries um, over time. Um, and Ray mm-hmm. Dalio actually thinks that globalization has peaked. He thinks we'll, we will actually see a retraction of globalization, that businesses- That's what we're seeing at the moment, so- It's certainly what we're seeing at the moment. And it, and it makes sense. It's kind of a reaction to the fact that it, businesses have just been so exposed to it. I think most recently, uh, Apple has been suffering because of the the lockdowns in China and, and their exposure mm. to manufacturing in China. And they're moving, they're not- deglobalizing, but they're moving their manufacturing or they're expanding manufacturing in India um, and some other countries now. So they're kind of reacting to what's going on. So it is, that's kind of an interesting factor of, of that might take place. You know, our business is going to be able to continue to lower their costs with more globalization over time, Mm. or are we actually going to see a reversal of, of that where margins get worse, uh, because they're having to bring kind of more or wanting to bring more of their supply chain back into the country to reduce that exposure. Yeah. 
So that's, that's and I think it was like Intel announced that this was a while ago. They said they'll bring in like building massive, massive factories in the US now as opposed to right. overseas. Um, it, it's just the trade off, isn't it? I mean, you could rely on manufacturing in other countries as a as a business and yes it's cheaper but there's a risk it's like there's a risk to everything the risk mm. is that for whatever reason maybe it's a covid lockdown maybe it's some sort of political turmoil or maybe even a war or something like that and all of a sudden your globalization globalization effort which has you know been reducing your costs for the last 5 years is now all of a sudden causing you a big headache mm. Or do you suffer, and I'm speaking a lot for like US companies, do you suffer things like higher wages and whatever to bring your manufacturing in-house? Like in in the US, you save a little bit because you don't have to ship things around the world. You know, you know you've got local, you know you're very in control because everything's local. Yeah. But it costs you more. Yeah. So- yeah, it's it's a question. I think I think there'll be like obviously there'll be a combination of both, um, yeah. but I think that the companies that can easily afford to not uh, not rely on globalization will will trend away from it. And I think that's already kind of what we're seeing. I don't think that's revolutionary uh, prediction. I think that's just what we've already seen. Yeah, yeah, for but sure. I don't know. Yeah, we'll yeah. see. Anyway, so that's kind of all I took away from uh, so far, at least from the the World Economic Forum. I, there, there was a lot of things discussed. I could have gone into. Uh, there was a lot of political things that I probably I just didn't want to kind of bring onto the podcast. A lot of yeah, discussion I just don't around like politics. Yeah, a lot of discussion around the the conflicts going on at the moment and uh, freedom of speech and all of these other topics. So there is a lot of interesting stuff there if you want to kind of dive into some of the different speakers. But in terms of what I found noteworthy uh, and related to investing in particular. Um, nothing mm. so far, but hopefully, or just those stories so far. So hopefully there will be um, some stuff on over the next day that'll um, kind of dive mm. into some more interesting topics, but that's all I got so mm. far. All right, cool. Where to next? <laughs> um, do you want to take Terra? us? Yeah, I think we should go through this because this is really, really interesting. I've been following this lightly. Um, I've been watching some YouTube videos on it and it's a very interesting story. Yeah, I still, my brain, like... You guys know I am not a crypto guy. Really? I'm, yes, <laughs> it might it, it might surprise you, Hamish, but I don't invest in cryptocurrencies. Um, so I'm gonna gonna speak at like the level that I kind of understood it at, <laughs> and I'm sure there will be a few of you guys out there. It'll be big crypto heads, which will be like, well, actually, you could have explained that a little bit more in depth. <laughs> it's like, okay, I, I don't quite have that uh, understanding, but uh, Terra Luna. You probably heard it in the news. Uh, it was a stable coin that crashed about two weeks ago. And uh, there's a reason I'm talking about it this week, but I'll give you a bit of a background. Um, from peak to trough, it lost about $60 billion in market cap. Yeah. Coin cap, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> market cap of coin. <laughs> um, so it, the way it worked, it, it's a stable coin, so they try and peg it to the US dollar. Okay, and there are a lot of stable coins which are pegged to the US dollar by real assets. Terra Luna was not pegged to the US dollar by real assets. It was Mm. pegged um, through financial engineering. So it worked through two coins, Uh, two coins, one ecosystem. So there was Terra and then there was Luna. Terra was the coin that was linked, that was pegged to the US dollar. So one Terra is supposed to equal one US dollar. Mm. And then you've got Luna and they do funny things with Luna conversion to Terra to make sure Terra stays pegged to the US dollar. Mm. Um, So when Terra went above the price of one US dollar, they make more Terra tokens by people swapping a dollar's worth of Luna to form new Terra tokens. So then they can sell their new Terra tokens for slightly more than one US dollar because the price went up. Um, and then there's more Terra tokens total, so there's less scarcity, and that brings the price back down to where they need it to be to peg it to mm. the US dollar. Stable, very stable. Stable. But, I mean, you can understand, <laughs> like, the, the methodology makes sense. Yeah. 
Um, and then when Terra falls below the value of one US dollar, you can trade your Terra tokens in for one US dollar uh, value of Luna, again, making a small profit in the process. So you can, it's like um, convertible back and forth. You can convert one to another and make a little profit, which whichever way you want. Anyway, so that's how the kind of peg to the US dollar system works. Um so what did I write here next? Uh, yeah, pretty much as a lunar holder. So Terra stays stable, lunar bounces. As a Terra, uh, as a lunar holder, you're hoping that the Terra adoption increases and the coin becomes more useful or more valuable. So then the demand or the price rises for that coin. So over mm-hmm. time, you can convert your lunar into Terra and, and that's how you kind of profit. Um As I said before, the problem here is this is an algorithmic stable coin. So it uses financial engineering to maintain its stability, uh, whereas other stable coins use actual financial assets to keep their link to the dollar. Um, This is what Wall Street Journal had to say, quote, such designs have been criticized by market observers as risky because they rely on traders to push the value back to $1 rather than having assets that continually support the price. Mm. Because then if the traders aren't willing to buy them, coins can go into a so-called death spiral. (laughs) That Um, that couldn't happen. That couldn't, that (laughs) could never, don't worry about it, guys. It's all G, it's never going to happen. Um, Terra USD has mostly maintained its dollar peg, but it has been broken in bouts of heavy volatility. <clears throat> mm, and right. guess what? Guess what happened, Hamish? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> A few weeks ago, Terra broke its peg and it crashed and burned. Right. So th- this is Luna, the the Luna coin, right? That crashed, right? Yeah. What? Well, yeah. Yeah. Terra I guess Terra so. Luna, I think it's called. Terra. Well, yeah, it's- well, yeah. Terra Luna. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the ticker is like Luna. But yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at the I'm looking at the chart now. I think it was uh, its peak was 107 dollars a token, I guess, or a coin, yeah. and now it is 0.0001. Yes, <laughs> you, you ruined my payoff, but oh, I'll I'm give sorry. it to you. I'll, I'll give it to you. But yes, the, I got confused there. So yeah, Terra. The terror side of it, that's the thing that crashed because right. that was supposed to be, well, that was supposed to be the the link to the US dollar. And then okay. it was no, like it went down to, I think, 69 cents. That's not supposed to happen. It's supposed right. to say like very, very close to one US dollar. Anyway, got it, got it, got it. Got it. Um, Wall Street article on the 9th of May. Quote, the break in the peg, which began over the weekend, started with a series of large withdrawals of Terra USD from Anchor Protocol, a sort of decentralized bank for crypto investors, Mm. said uh, Ilan Solot, a partner at a crypto hedge fund called Tagus Capital LLP. Anchor Protocol, which is built on the technology of the same Terra blockchain network that Terra USD is based on, had a major factor in the growth of the stablecoin in recent months by allowing crypto investors to earn returns of nearly 20% annually by lending out their Terra USD holdings. In tandem with the big withdrawals, Terra USD uh, was also being sold for other stable coins backed by traditional assets through various liquidity pools that contribute to the stability of the peg, um, as well as through cryptocurrency exchanges. So long story short, as you said before, um, we're at 167 Australian dollars and it fell to, what was it? Two one hundred. this in Australian dollars, two one hundredths of a cent. Yeah, sorry for I spoiled your um, your big surprise. I got a little bit you excited did. there, but that is absolutely insane. Um, and it's also funny hearing you describe the 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 twenty percent return. And I think Coffeezilla did a good video on this about how it was basically a Ponzi scheme because as more demand came in for the coin, that was funding this twenty percent annual return that you were supposed to be getting by having by lending out the coin. So it was kind of the only thing that was driving that return was demand in the coin, uh, which is what a Ponzi scheme is. <laughs> mm. That's what, unfortunately, all of these things end up in some sort of Ponzi schemes. But anyway. Yeah, that's that's, um, that's crazy. Grim. Yeah, and I think it was, a, I don't know if you, it is, I think it was a top 10 largest cryptocurrency. Um, yeah, I don't know about largest cryptocurrency, but oh. like, you, no, 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 you very well could be right. I'm just saying I don't know, but it, it was the third largest stable coin. Right. Okay. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Stabling can, air quotes. Yeah. Someone can fact, fact check me on that. I'm pretty sure um, it was like a top 10 largest by market cap, um, which is scary. The fact that it absolutely got deleted. Mm. Oh, like in a very, very short time. <laughs> it says here, as, as Terra USD decoupled from its peg um, on May 10th, 
uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen uh, has, uh, spoke out with renewed calls for Congress to pass legislation to govern stablecoins. The same time, at the same hearing, Pennsylvania Senator Pat Toomey, the Banking Committee's top Republican, expressed an interest in moving quickly on related legislation. Wow. So there you go. Well, they want to crack down on it. But the news yeah. this week, sorry, were you going to say something? I was just going to say the idea of a stable coin that's actually backed by currency makes a lot of sense. So it's easy to kind of transact in cryptocurrency mm. to basically US dollars without actually exiting the current, uh, the crypto market. Um, mm. But yeah, to, it has to be backed by something. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's the thing. I mean, if uh, it's very clever if you can financially engineer it to not be backed up. Like very clever. You you're good at maths. Yeah. Congratulations. You, However, you're always relying on the the people, the people that are trading. Like if they go, then it's gone. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, even the US currency is not backed by anything and even the US government's losing the grip on, on yeah. the currency at the moment. So <laughs> uh, That's funny. Um, but anyway, the reason that I chucked this in this week is guess what, Hamish Hodder? What? Terra is announced on Twitter. Ba, ba, da, ba, 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 Terra 2.0 is coming with overwhelming support. The Terra ecosystem has voted to pass proposal 1623 calling for the genesis of a new blockchain and the preservation of our community. Let me guess. It's a it's the stablest coin. It's it's <laughs> <laughs> our stable coin wasn't quite stable. <laughs> so we're going to make a rock solid coin. <laughs> um, but there you go. Wow, there you go. That's, and I think Terra. I think the Terra 2.0 is actually, it's not a stable coin, right? I'm pretty sure it's uh, like, it's just, a, they've just converted it into a normal cryptocurrency. I don't think it's- Oh, I don't know. I'm pretty sure they're not. I heard, I, I've, I've very vaguely kind of listened to some videos on this and I think I right. heard that. Um, but yeah, it's, right. a, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating story. There's uh, all these like interviews coming out of the person, the founder who made the coin, um, from before it was successful and nobody knew who he was. Um, and there's a bunch of kind of videos of him basically saying that he expects it to crash and burn one day. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. He was like, what do you think about these cryptocurrencies? He's like, yeah, a lot of them crash and burn. And then they're like, could it happen to Terra? And he was like, uh, I hope not. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway, Disaster. There you, go. there you go. Yeah. Stable coins. Wow. We- Hashtag stable. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about the US currency, which is another stable currency. Very, <laughs> very, very stable. Um, stable. Hey, I own stable coin. It's called one dollar, one US dollar. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it does raise some of some kind of similar ideas it because does. it isn't backed by gold anymore, whereas it used to be. Um, yeah. So it's completely backed by confidence of people yeah, in the currency. Absolutely. Um, so the US economy, confidence in the US economy. And yeah, so I mean, obviously it's kind of the world's currency, so there's a quite a lot of confidence in the US dollar, but yeah, we're seeing a lot of currencies around the world lose confidence very very quickly. So it is kind of an interesting environment, but we got a f- we got uh, the minutes from the Federal Reserve's meeting that happened on the 3rd and 4th of May. So we kind of get the summary a little bit later where we get a bit more details about what they spoke about. Um, At that meeting, of course, we saw the first 0.5% interest rate increase. Um, So we saw that. Last week, we spoke a little bit about the Jerome Powell uh, Wall Street Journal uh, interview. And in that uh, that interview, he spoke about um, the need to be more aggressive on inflation Uh, This week, we got the minutes, as I just mentioned, Uh, the summary stated, uh, all participants affirmed their strong commitment and determination to take measures necessary to restore price stability. Uh, They went on to say, uh, to this end, participants agree the committee committee should be uh, fast to move on the stance of monetary policy towards a neutral position through both increases in the target range for the federal funds rate and reductions in the size of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. Um, So a couple of things there, Um, their interest rate plan, it looks like they're planning to do 50 basis points or 0.5% interest rate increases on a month over month basis for each of the next few meetings for kind of the foreseeable future. 
Um, so mm. it's essentially assuming that inflation doesn't reach the 2% target all of a sudden <laughs> feels unlikely. Uh, we should expect to see interest rates uh, rise from the current 1% to about 2 to 3% by the end of the year. So that's kind of the the, the range um, that uh, the US is kind of looking at. And then on the balance sheet side, uh, uh, essentially uh, each month they're going to be increasing the amount of treasury and mortgage-backed securities that are being sold. So they're kind of reducing their balance sheet, uh, which is currently $9 trillion that they have bought of financial assets. So they're going to kind of get rid of some it's of that. It's a lot of trillions. Yeah, got to do a little bit of selling, just a smidge. Um, so they're going to be just peaking uh, at uh, 95 billion in sales, uh, which is 60 treasury uh, bonds and, and 35 mortgage-backed securities by August. And then from August on, it will be just 95 billion per month. Um, and if you remember, they right. were at their peak, they were kind of ramping, that was buying 120 billion per month. So um, they're not even offloading right. equally as much as they were onloading during the, the pandemic kind of period. So they're just trying to just offload a little bit. But yeah, as you can imagine, um, 95 billion a month nine trillion dollars is a <laughs> there's quite yeah. there's quite a few months there at that rate um that they'll be doing that so what's one trillion it was about nine uh, how, i'm trying to figure times. out how many months how many months would they have to go before what is it that like a hundred i don't i don't know hang on so there's one my tired tr- my tired brain can't do that's maths. million that's <laughs> i think it's a hundred I don't know, Divided probably. by 95. 94.7 months. If, if they go offload so the 95, uh, the 9 trillion in uh, at 95 billion per month. 95. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, you're right. 94. Yeah. There you Beautiful. go. Yeah, so. So, yeah. 94 months from now and we're back to zero and, you know, great. We're, we're back to square. Yeah, that's not going to have any, any no, damage to the market. Happen. Yeah, so it's, um yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's an interesting kind of, uh, I, I guess, I mean, we knew a little bit of this already, so it's not anything kind of groundbreaking again. We're just kind of, they're just slowly ramping up their, their rhetoric on, on what they're going to be doing. They're being very, very careful about it, but also they're saying a lot now, whereas, you know, a mm. while ago they was, they really weren't saying that much about being aggressive. Now they're saying we're being aggressive. Stop spending. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they're trying. Yeah. But, um, we'll see what happens. Yeah. On a related note, yeah. Uh, about a week ago, I missed this last week. I, actually, I can't remember if we spoke about it, but I think we missed it. Um, but UK inflation hit 9%, uh, and that was driven by a 2.5% monthly increase. <laughs> Ooh. So, uh, yeah, US hasn't seen one of those, which is uh, Ooh. even uh, through the oil crisis, like, what, a couple months ago, it was a 0.8% increase in the US. So, 25 is an astounding monthly increase. In fact- Do you reckon that's uh, like oil and gas- Issues? Or I no? don't, I don't know. know. To be yeah, completely I don't know honest that with you, that is just astounding. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll see if get my editor to put this chart on screen for the video podcast. So if you're listening with audio, jump over to the YouTube version. But look at this chart. <laughs> this is it's, the this is the yearly inflation rate, and it's uh, it's just a genuine hockey stick. Oh, hockey stick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like that is that is terrifying. It's going up in a straight line. Yeah. Um, that so, is worrying. Yeah. You could you could play hockey with that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's crazy. So, yeah. Um, that is so steep. Again, I don't mean to be kind of all dark on this stuff, but um, it's just insane. Like how much has shifted since the, the start of the pandemic, I guess. We went from uh, mm. low economic growth. We couldn't even get... Uh, we couldn't get inflation into the target of of you know one to two percent. It was below one percent. It was <laughs> it was dead. We, we were th- we were looking at potentially deflation. And the pandemic hits. Everyone has to spend trillions of dollars because that's just what you had to do. And now we're seeing the kind of the other side of that. So it's just it's just been a it's not nice, but it's also been a very fascinating kind of just to watch it um kind of unfold. Yeah, it is pretty crazy just how how much it's changed. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. rewind two years and we're literally like inflation. You don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Come on. It's been like less than 2% for the past 10 years. Yeah. You were laughed at if you thought there was going to be any level of inflation in 2020, even while the spending was going on and Dahlia was making it his, his statements about <laughs> how, yeah, you can't do this without a reaction in the economy. And mm. everyone was like, Oh, shut up. <laughs> shut up, old man. Shut up, yeah. grandpa. <laughs> 
<laughs> Michael Burry was making his bets and all that. He's yeah. betting on inflation. Yeah. He actually came out the other day and said that uh, he 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 the way. 2022 is like watching a plane crash. I saw that, yeah. <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, that sounds about right. Anyway. Yeah. Jeez, how how cheery has this podcast been? Uh, I know. It, it gets like this in moments, I think, but- uh, It does. But yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. It's just, it's just what's happening in the world. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't think you have to be overly- negative you don't have to feel i don't you don't want people to go away feeling negative about oh my god inflation is out of control we're all we're all stuffed like it's just it's just what's happening um yeah. so it just you know yeah. it is it is what it is but we've got challenges but you know i mean long term we'll be right yeah she'll be gotta, right <laughs> she'll be right mate we just got to focus on the long term yeah um all right yeah do we have anything <clears throat> Cheery to talk about? I, I no. Oh, maybe, maybe slightly if you are an investor in Chinese tech. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, China has shown signs of easing its crackdown on the technology sector, uh, which has wiped billions of dollars of value from its most prominent companies. Since the end of 2020, Beijing has introduced stricter regulation on its domestic technology sector in a bid to rein in the power of some of its biggest companies. Which you know, fair enough. They don't want monopolies. No one monopolies are very bad for consumers. They're good for investors. But some of the uh, best kind of monopolies, I guess, make me very, very frustrated <laughs> as a consumer. <laughs> we're talking. Was it? Were I talking to you? Like Adobe, for example. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah. like they they infuriate me with their software. But I it's can't like wait. They got to a get, switching mode. Yeah, I can't wait to escape Adobe. Yeah, <laughs> escape their clutches. I but just, for now, yeah, I can't do it. Yeah, for people who don't understand, I mean, it's like we've learned how to video edit on, a, for example, on Adobe software, mm. um, and there's just a le- not a huge learning curve, I, I guess, but there is a learning curve to switching to Apple software, for example, um, mm. and that's just time that will where editing will be Spurned. slower or doing other tasks will be slower. Um, so it's just, you, you just don't want to make the shift, even though it might be a lot cheaper, might be mm. better, might work better on a Mac or whatever it is. You just, I just, you don't want to, you just know that you're in for a kind of a tough time immediately after mm. you can switch. Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing is that Adobe is, has the most complete suite of programs. Yes. Whereas other, like you could switch to Final Cut, but it's just Final Cut. So yeah, you're still using photo, you're still you're yeah. still using some of Adobe's programs, even if you're using Final Cut. So it's a, it's a big switching mode, and it, and it infuriates me. But anyway, um, back to what we're talking about. Um, rules in areas from antitrust to data pr- uh, protection have come into effect in a swift manner in the past 16 months. The moves have caught international investors off guard and sparked a dramatic sell-off in the stocks of domestic titans from Tencent to Alibaba, just in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, this, these stats are from last week. So I was going to talk about this last week, um, but we didn't get a chance. So this is from last week. Um but it's this is roughly the same story. Alibaba. So this is all these different companies in the last twelve months. Their stock price performance, right? Mm. Alibaba f- down fifty eight percent in the last twelve months. Ten cent forty five percent. Baidu thirty seven percent. JD twenty seven percent. Pinduoduo seventy percent. Neo fifty two percent. So all of these big um, Chinese techie companies have just been absolutely destroyed. Um, but Beijing has signaled some of the scrutiny of the tech sector may ease as its economy faces pressure from a resurgence of COVID and subsequent lockdowns on Tuesday. So this would have been last Tuesday, I guess, uh, Chinese officials met with some of the country's top technology executives in the further signs of easing. Following the meeting, China's vice premier, uh, Liu He, pledged support for the technology sector and plans for internet companies to go public. It comes after uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping in April chaired a meeting of the Politburo. 
Politburo, a top decision-making body, the Politburo pledged to support the healthy development of so-called of, of the so-called platform economy, which includes internet companies in areas from social media to e-commerce. Wow! So there you go. There you go. It's a little hint of yeah. happiness. I mean, this. Yeah, I, I was trying a little to little hint of joy. <laughs> just, just a smidge. Yeah, I, I was, but I mean, this. Yeah. The, if 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 you follow these companies, I mean, it's if you really take the time to think about China's objectives these big tech companies, all of this makes total sense. Like they don't, if you had, if you were the, if you were Xi Jinping and you have maybe 10 of your largest companies are these super massive tech companies that basically all of your citizens use. It's like, is your thinking, yeah, let's, let's teach these companies a lesson. (laughs) Or is your thinking more, I want China to do well because I'm China's leader. So while I don't want monopolies, I also don't want to screw over my biggest companies. Mm. I think your thinking is more on the second. Like, yes, you want to stop monopoly. You want to help Chinese consumers. You want the consumer to be protected and to be able to thrive. But at the same time, you don't want to kill your biggest companies. Yeah. That would just be silly. Yeah, it is an it is interesting to watch because it is kind of a clash of two ideas. One is kind of letting capitalist businesses thrive, um, but then that's kind of clashing with with China's typical object objective, which is to kind of enforce kind of from top down um, values on 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 people. Whether it's you know what was it the kids are allowed to play on internet games one yeah. hour a day over Friday Saturday or Thursday Friday Saturday, and that's it. Um, yeah or something like that. So that's obviously a significant imposition on, on people's values and that hurts the business. So it's kind of this striking of, of, uh, of a balance that they're trying to have, um, which is kind of interesting to watch, uh, mm. which you don't see as you see it to some extent in the U S but not as much for sure. Yeah. So, but yeah, but there you go. So that's, uh, that's really all I had to talk about there. Um, Hmm. It's just what else, what did someone say? Despite these more soothing tones from Beijing, experts doubt there will be a huge shift in policy. Quote, I don't believe that the regulator's actions will really stop. Various ministries still have a mandate to enforce all the regulations that have been amended and strengthened, said Charles Mock, a visiting scholar at the Global Digital Policy Incubator at Stanford University. Quote, even if there are some reversals, it may be too late to reverse the damage. For example, even if they allow more listings overseas, the investor confidence is still already lost and the scrutiny and hostility from the foreign market also cannot be reversed. So that's kind of a, an opposing opinion, I guess. But uh, Yeah, I, I think confidence will come back over time. Um, I think it's hard. To, it's, yeah. dif- it's difficult to say in the, in the, in the short term um, and with Who knows? Yeah. little changes here and there. But, but um, yeah, I mean, there's clearly some very, very powerful and strong businesses in China that will mm. very likely continue to be very strong on a global yeah, you, scale. I think you could crack down on them quite hard and they would still be all right. Yeah. It's yeah. like even if you crack down hard on Google or Facebook, they're still like they're still going to be all right. Mm, yeah. You know? Speaking of uh, digital advertisers, Snapchat is the- Oh, uh, like segue, my, segue. Like my segue How's there? that segue game? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to I was gonna say, speaking of another tech company that's been destroyed, um, but- uh, <laughs> That would have worked as well. Yeah, I, I had a couple up my sleeve, but um, hey. yeah, Snapchat this week, I had a glance at it. It's down f- 40%. Yeah, this one's getting killed. Yeah, that's, that's a murder. That's an absolute murder, 40% that's, in a week. Yeah. Um, Someone's going to jail for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a anyway. serious crime. Um, <laughs> I, I, the stock's actually down. I thought with 40% this week, it was going to be down like 95% or something, but it's down 80%. So, you know, it's in, it's, it's not too bad, you know, 80% yeah, down is almost fine. positive news. That's fine. If you expect it's going to be down 95% and it's down 80, yeah. then you're happy. Yeah. Everyone else's <laughs> portfolios are down 80% at the moment, right? That's that's normal, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. At least it's not 95%, Hamish. Hey, <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, so they, of course, reported their earnings, which is why the stock uh, collapsed so badly. Um, their numbers weren't awful, um, just missed expectations. Right. Um, 
Uh, revenue came in at $1.1 billion for the quarter, up 38% year over year. So they're still growing their top line, um, driven, of course, um, by their, their advertising business, which has been kind of shielded a little bit more from the iOS change than Facebook, at least according to the CEO, uh, because they do a lot more brand advertising. So it's, yeah, it's not- it's just all brand. It's not this kind of targeted adver- advertising. No. It's just kind of general brand Drink awareness. Coca-Cola. Yes, exactly mm. right. You don't need to be tracking people across apps to- to advertise Coca-Cola in front of people. So, um, yeah, revenue was still up. Uh, the net loss did grow, so they're not profitable. Um, it grew to uh, negative, or well, the loss was $360 million. Uh, daily active users continued to grow. Eight, it grew by 18% year over year. Jeez, that's all right. Yeah, to 332 million. So, um, you know, yeah, they're, they're, they're a far way off um, some of the big titans, but- uh, It's like on par with Twitter, isn't it? I think so, right? I think well, Twitter's- Twitter plus bots. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter and all its bots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about twice the size of Twitter if it's uh, w- without bots. But um, <laughs> no, three but, times the size. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Um, yeah, that was another thing. Didn't Elon say that he wants a twenty five percent discount on on the acquisition if there's twenty five percent bots or something like that? He, that's what I think Probably. he said that recently, which was kind of an oh, interesting, um, oh, okay, interesting point of view. He's trying to get a bit of a bit of a haircut on his uh, on his deal, but does make sense though like bit bit of a tangent here but like if you had 25 percent less monetizable users than what is stated in the sec filings yeah i think it's kind of fair to ask for a 25 percent discount yeah that's the thing right it, it's they've stated that publicly in an sec filing of mm. what their estimation of bots are and if it's dramatically wrong then yeah the that's that's a pretty critical thing but that the, they've lied about. <laughs> the problem is, I don't know what maybe the stock price will do, but if if Elon wants a twenty five percent discount, won't the board just say, mm, "Yeah, nah, we'll pass on your offer." Yeah. Cheers. I think that's what the article I was reading before was alluding to that the board kind of has all of the power, so mm, it's going to be kind yeah. of difficult for, for him to enforce anything there. But anyway, that's a Snapchat. Back to Snapchat. Uh, Snapchat <laughs> chief executive Evan Spiegel, is that how you pronounce yeah, his name? Yeah, Evan yeah. Spiegel said, uh, well, he warned, uh, like many companies, we continue to face rising inflation and interest rates, supply chain shortages and labor, uh, and labor disruptions, platform policy changes, the impact of the war in Ukraine and more. So, What yeah. supply chain shortages is Snapchat facing? <laughs> That is a great question. I guess uh, is he maybe he's talking about the fact that businesses are pulling back advertising. Oh yeah, maybe as yeah, a result. Yeah. But uh, yeah, what supply <laughs> changes? Yeah, what are they? <laughs> maybe what are they? They make those little glasses, don't they? <laughs> those stupid glasses. We're not that- selling enough spectacles. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely the Snapchat classes. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't the know. The biggest part of our business. What? Are, uh, I mean, what? Are, yeah, they're just kind of servers, I guess, and employees. That would be pretty much. What yeah, it, that'd be it. Yeah, what it'd they, just be talent. What, it'd just be. Uh, it'd be labor. It'd be workers. Yeah, engineer, uh, software engineers and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, they're just again just reiterating the the many macroeconomic events that are kind of hurting businesses at the moment. Um, I, I had a quick look at the valuation because whenever a stock falls 80%, um, you know, it's a, it's it's sometimes a good idea to, to investigate it and see, well, are people overreacting? Are they going Could from- Could be an opportunity. Exactly. Are people going from being overhyped about this business because it's a relatively new business on the market? I think, what, two, couple of years, not too long, maybe two or three years it's been public. So it's obviously been through the IPO hype um, is it oversold? Has it kind of swung the other way? Um, but even after an 80% drop, the stock has a price to free cash flow of 115. <laughs> Ooh, yay, so, um, what's happening to their free cash flow over time? Is it, it's is been, it a lot? Uh, let me pull it up here. What did I have like here? If, well, if it's, it's been negative and growing a lot. I think so. They got profitable for the first time on a cash flow basis in, uh, 2021. So it's oh, kind of the okay. first right. year, but the reason why they're not profitable on the income line, uh, and someone pointed this out on Twitter, I, I can't remember the actual stats, but they pay a lot of stock-based compensation to executives. Um, they paid right. a, so they they made two hundred million in uh, in free cash flow, um, yeah. but if you take into account the stock-based compensation, which was a billion dollars. 
Uh, cool. And you assume that even though it's not a cash cost, if you assume it as a cost, then yeah, they're deeply negative. Um, <laughs> well done, guys. 200 million <laughs> in the bank. All right, here's a billion dollars yeah, for you. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to pay you in stock. So our <laughs> cash looks great. No, Jeez. so yeah, that's kind of, I think they've been, I would imagine they're diluting pretty heavily. Yeah. So the number of shares has doubled in the last five years. So their executives are, yeah, they're, they're loving it at Snapchat. Um, at the moment. And I think is what I was saying before, I think someone on Twitter shared something where I, I think it was Snapchat. I might be getting this wrong, but I think uh, n- there's been no insider buys since it IPO'd or something like that. And the insider sells was like an astounding amount of money, like m- like a lot of money <laughs> was being sold by executives. Mm-hmm. Um, so Jeez. yeah, interesting, interesting kind of situation for, for Snapchat. And yeah, we'll, we'll kind of see how they perform over time, I guess, in a relative way to Facebook, which potentially is more or it's believed to be more exposed to these kind of the, the iOS change and these other crackdowns. So we'll kind of see how that how that looks for, for businesses like Snapchat, which, yeah, they kind of do this generic advertising, which is kind of, I feel, I, I guess, I don't know if this is a weird opinion. I feel like it's not, but I think being tracked for like basic data and then getting ads that are relevant is like better than getting ads that are not relevant to you at all. It's kind of- From dis- a user perspective. Yeah, from a user perspective. It's kind yeah, of disruptive of when you see ads on like, like TikTok, for example, their ads are always just completely off <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because they're not targeted. Um, same with with same with Snapchat. Um, it's kind of annoying when you see ads yeah. like that. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, know. when it's just like, well- Great lawn mowing products or something. Well, that's not relevant to me at all. Yeah, or like or a something. mobile game. Like I've never yeah. downloaded a mobile game in my life. <laughs> yeah, it's like nope. <laughs> I'm, I'm not your customer. <laughs> True. Honestly, the ad experience is better if I get something. You know, it's new Star Wars merch or something like that, or yeah, something. I don't know, SpaceX something something. It's like oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Anyway. Um. But there you go. But then again, sometimes people just want you to read their logo. That's it. So while it might be annoying, it still achieves its goal. So yeah, yeah, that's a good point. It's like Sprite. Okay, cool. Um, maybe that'll next time I think, oh, I'm thirsty, I might think Sprite. Yeah. So yeah, some some okay. brand yeah brand advertising like that can it's not intrusive. I guess I mean kind of maybe it's like uh, direct like direct marketing um, ads right. that are not targeted at you. Like like download oh, this right. mobile game or like- Yeah, yeah, I don't know, yeah. Whatever, okay, whatever okay. it is where they're trying to, it's very specific. Yeah, I get what I don't mean. know. Yeah. yeah. But anyway. <clears throat> it's like, yeah, actually one example, and this is something that <laughs> I don't know why. I literally, I, if, I do not know why, but on Facebook of all platforms, the ones with the most data, mm. I get ads in my timeline about- this device that, I don't know, it's like electrical stimulation that you put on your stomach mm. for period pain. Yeah, I get that as well. That's actually good targeting though because it's like a pre- it's supposed to be, you're supposed to buy it for your partner, right? Oh, are you? Yeah. Oh, is that their strategy? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oh, but that, okay. th- No, but that's actually a good point because I get that ad as well and it's they do a lot of advertising because I swear every time I go on Instagram or Facebook, I get one of those ads. They yeah. must be spending a lot of money on ads. They must be. But uh, honestly, like I am never going to buy their product. <laughs> like just, I'm just not. So it's like, yeah. I, I just see that. And I'm like, man, they must be burning a lot of cash in advertising. Yeah. But it's also been an ad that I've seen for a long time. So their, their ads must work. Maybe. I mean, we're here talking extent. about them right now. Yeah. So we've just promoted their product. Share site. What- we mean share site. That's what we yeah, get share- at. <laughs> Um, I don't know what their company's called though. I'd have absolutely no yeah, clue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just know what the thing is. That's a good point. It doesn't really stick in your head. No, no. it doesn't. Yeah. Anyway. So there you go. Uh, anything else on Snapchat? No, that's it. That's All right. It. Let's do maybe two two quick questions. Yep. Yeah. As always, if you've got <clears throat> Q&A questions, head over to the Young Investors Podcast YouTube channel. Most recent episode, click on it, drop us a comment, ask a question, and uh, and we shall answer it. Um, all right, I have a question. Mm-hmm. Well, this is this is the question. <laughs> the question says, "I have a question. Where do you get your news from?" Yeah, it's a it's a good uh, that's a. Good- I mean, f- for the podcast, it's mainly just like news sites, CNBC, yeah, 
Wall Street Journal. I mean, you always have to scout with a grain of salt, always. But. Yeah, probably CNBC is a big one, Australian Financial Review for Australian staff, yeah. The Age. So, just big news organisations. Um, then kind of, I mean, I will just generally just use Google News on the app, um, yep. which get, kind of sources a lot of different places. And then also, um, so I get Google gives you an alert for your watch list of stocks if you put it in there. Um, so I, I check that every now and then I usually don't really, I don't care about the stock prices in, on any given day, but I can pull that up and I can just scroll down and it'll give me news on the companies that are in that watch list. So I'll kind of, again, just Google news, kind of scour through that. Um, and then more recently I've been getting into Twitter a little bit, so you can follow me on Twitter if you want. Um, but yeah, Twitter is actually quite good for business news. Um, what's your handle? Uh, Hey, I don't know, actually Hamish Hodder, I presume at Hamish Hodder. I'm sure you could just Let me type, have a look. type in Hamish Hodder. It'll come up. It's got to be that, right? Yeah, at Hamish yeah. underscore Hotter. I need to get on Twitter. I really do. Yeah, it's good. It's good fun because I, I, I have, um, I don't know, you just have like these little thoughts or you get like angry at something. Not angry, but like you, <laughs> you have just a little thought about something. Something ticks you off. Yeah, so you can just blast it out there and, you know, you know, you can just, you can just delete it because the internet's not forever, obviously. You just pull it. <laughs> uh, no, yeah. but it is, it is good for like if I see a news story or something related to an industry I'm looking at, um, like I was looking at streaming. So I, I shared the the latest engagement data, um, just little things like that. I, I can't, there's not really anywhere else to put that. I could put it on Instagram, but um, mm. it's more native, I think, in, uh, in, yeah, in Twitter. Yeah, I think you're right. There mm. you go. All right. I'll, um, uh, yeah. D did you have any, uh, anything no, to add on no, that one? No. Or I'll ask, should, do you want me to ask you this one? Sure. Um, do either of you use the Kelly formula for sizing? If not, why? Um, I should. The Kelly criterion. Mm. Um, it's, a, yeah, I just, I wanted to get a good definition. So I've just typed it into Google. It's essentially a, um, <clears throat> it's a formula. Uh, I'll just read the definition here. Uh, in probability theory, the Kelly criterion is a formula that determines the optimal theoretical size for a bet. Hmm. Uh, it is valid when the expected returns are known. So essentially, there's this uh, formula where if you if you're following a couple of different companies and you know what they're what you think they're worth and and what you would like to you know what you can pay for them, what their price is, it can you can chuck this stuff into a formula and it can actually tell you okay based on these criteria you've given the formula, uh, you should put like 80% of your money into this option and 20% into this option. It's stuff like that. It's like yeah. a mathematical way. The, it's a mathematical formula that, that investors sometimes use to know, to, to really have, a, a, you know, a, an answer to how much they should put, what percentage of their portfolio they should put in different kind of bets. Um, I don't know it inside and out. Um, it's mentioned a lot in Monish Prabhai's book, I think, uh, Dando Investor. Right. But it is, it is like very, it's a very good formula. Um, and it also cuts through, uh, the psychology of, of putting, like, for example, it's not uncommon sometimes for the Kelly criterion to say, you should put 99% of your portfolio, into this one opportunity. So it kind of gives you a, a not like a, oh, but I never put more than 20% into this. It cuts through the psychology of all that. And it just yeah. says probabilistically you should do this. Yeah. But um, I, I don't actually use it, but I'll, I'll look into it. I'll make a point to look into it more Yeah, to understand I, it in depth. I know a lot of people refer to it. I, it's something I haven't studied kind of deeply. And really, I think my hesitation with it is, I'm not convinced that you can come up with a reasonable probability for a certain outcome for, for businesses. I think you can only look at a business and, and think that there's an overwhelming uh, chance that you won't lose money in, a, in an investment. I think you can kind of reach that conclusion and maybe you can reach a conclusion that it's very likely they'll perform at least this kind of minimum benchmark over time. Um, but beyond that, everywhere in the middle, businesses that, you know, are 50, figuring out if a business is 50, 50 or 60, 40 chance of bankruptcy or, or doubling, mm. I don't know if you can do that with a business. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm sure there's ways that you can use the Kelly criterion in a general kind of way that I just described, where if you're only making bets where there's a very low chance 
that you will lose money. That's kind of one element of the formula. Um, and then you can make some assessment about the the success of that um, that investment. If it does succeed, then I'm sure you can reach a conclusion. And I think Matt Peterson uses the Kelly criterion and reached a conclusion that he wants about 10 positions with about at, a, at about 10% each position right. based okay. on, I think, the, just the style of, of investments that he's looking at. So, yeah, yeah, I'll have to look into it more. I've heard a lot of people talk about it. So, it's just not something I've... I've dug into yet. Yep. Fair. Alrighty. Um, should we get out of here? Yeah. My parking's about to run out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> Must go. Um, but yeah, no, thanks guys very much for tuning in as always. We uh, we definitely appreciate it. As we said before, um, questions, comments, discussion topics, that sort of stuff. Uh, most recent YouTube post and just drops a comment. But yeah, apart from that, hopefully you enjoyed. Um, leave a like, subscribe, do all the things. Leave a review. That's what you do with the <laughs> podcast, isn't it? Leave a review. Um, but yeah, apart from that, guys, thanks very much for tuning in and we'll see you guys next week. See you guys.